Hello everyone, welcome to week two. I hope you enjoyed the module zero, module one, introducing yourself to each other and looking through our material on um, Mesopotamia and Egypt. Um, hope you learned a lot. If you didn't, that's okay too. Um, a little note on grading and deadlines moving forward. So I know for the first few assignments, a lot of you had trouble getting them in time for the deadline. And that's okay. I know it's the first week of the semester for our class, but you have other classes that this is kind of just jumping in in the middle. So you're still getting used to things. So I have a grace period for that first week in effect, but um, moving forward, I'm going to keep those hard deadlines. And I just, I wanted to be clear about that so that you know what to expect from me. I'm not going to be pushing back those deadlines uh, for the weeks ahead. So just want you to keep that in mind. Um, I'm not a harsh grader. I really, I accept a lot of different things. I'm very, very nice at grading. Uh, but when it comes to deadlines, that is the thing I'm pretty strict about. So, and I, I really, you may hate me for it, but I really think this is a good thing um, to require deadlines because you're going to be asked to meet deadlines for the rest of your life. Um, so getting into the practice of meeting those deadlines is really good. It's really good for just self-improvement, just being the best that we can be. Meet some deadlines. So that's all I'm asking. Um, yeah, if you have questions about that or if you struggle to meet the deadlines and it becomes something that you just really need some help on, reach out to me. I want to, you know, if, if this is an issue for you in terms of like completing the class, um, reach out to me and we can work out some kind of accessibility thing for you. The more that we can be in communication, again, conversation is one of my values. So if we can be in communication over these things, I can help you. But if you don't reach out to me and tell me, I can't help you. I just see that you didn't turn it in and then you get a zero on it. So it is always better to just turn in something. That's true with any class. You will always get more points than zero, um, even if you bomb the whole assignment. So please submit something. It's the best way you can succeed in this class. Okay, enough on that. Let's get into Mesoamerica. So this week we are talking about mostly Central America, modern day Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, right in between North and South America, a little bit of modern day Peru where the Inca Empire was. We're studying it before Columbus, obviously, because this class ends in the year 1500. Um, so Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. So we're not looking at that. So this area of history is referred to as pre-Columbian America. So that's what we're gonna be looking at. And because of the nature of this class and how much time I have and how much information I wanna throw at you, we are not gonna be looking at North America at all, which is a bummer. We're not, there's the Pueblo people, the Mississippi, the Navajo, the Hopi, and it's all very, very interesting. But because I wanna focus on larger civilizations and societies and uh, the big impact that we have in the world from Mesoamerica, South America, North America, we are gonna focus on uh, three and a half uh, civilizations in particular. First one is the Olmecs, who are uh, the oldest civilization in Mesoamerica. And then you have the Maya, who came after them, followed by the Mexica, who became the Aztec Empire, um, and then the Inca down in Peru. That's the kind of the outline of what we'll be talking about today. Um, and the reason this lecture is titled The Science of Human Sacrifice is because across all these civilizations, you know, there's tons of different societies and empires and kingdoms and, and chiefs and rulers, and they all warred against each other and they all had different traditions and beliefs. But there are a few through lines across these civilizations that all of them seem to have in common. And that is this connection between incredible scientific and mathematic advancement and deep, deeply held religious beliefs. And so they use their scientific advancements in connection with their religious beliefs. So, um, and, and human sacrifice was very common across Mesoamerica. So that's why it's the science of human sacrifice because it was more to them, th their science helped them understand their religion, which I think is really beautiful. So the science of human sacrifice. <laughs> Last week, we talked about how societies form, the importance of writing, and centralized government is crucial to maintain control over your people. We even talked about domestication of animals and horses and the chariot and how that made an impact on Meso Mesopotamian society. 
In Mesoamerica, forget all of that because none of that existed. Studying Mesoamerica is like no other part of the world because it, you know, developed in a vacuum away from the Eastern Hemisphere, no contact between North and South America and Europe, Asia, Africa, um, Australia, Middle East, excuse me, Southwest Asia. Um, so they're, they're developing on a totally different plane and there are some major, major differences that make it unique, but also make it really difficult to study. So I'm just gonna go over with you four big things that make studying the Americas very different from studying the rest of the world. Um, and you're gonna need to know for a test question, three of them. So pay attention to these. The number one reason that studying Mesoamerica is different than studying the Eastern Hemisphere is because of colonization. So I know that can be like a trigger thing. People have a lot of different opinions about that, but this is just historical fact. So let's set aside emotions and this is historical facts. Colonization has completely altered our understanding of the peoples of North and South America. And that is because when the Spanish in particular came in and began taking over territory and uh, spreading the Catholic religion, the pagan religions and the pagan beliefs of the Mesoamerican people were viewed as a threat to both Spanish conquest and hegemony, but also the spread of the Catholic faith. As a result of that, the, the Spanish conquistadors and the Catholic priests made an active attempt to destroy all record of native religion and belief. Because these people often saw their science and their religion united, everything that they had accomplished and all of the amazing things they had done were destroyed because they were associated with religious pagan rituals in the minds of the Catholic priests. So in the case of the Maya, we actually only have four total documents left from everything they've ever created. And that was because the Catholic priests and the Spanish conquistadors systematically destroyed their work in an effort to promote Catholic religion and ideology. So that's the number one reason uh, that studying Mesoamerica is so different. We don't have a ton of sources. We just, they were destroyed um, actively by colonization. Another reason studying Mesoamerica is so different and difficult is because most of the time, Mesoamerican civilizations did not have a strong centralized government. It just wasn't part of the makeup of, of their societies. So what they had instead was more of the territorial states that we learned about last week, where there was regional control by one people group or one city, and they required tribute from the surrounding regions, and they made alliances, and there was lots of trade, and there was regional influence. But there wasn't this strong central government. Um, that just wasn't the way things worked out in Mesoamerica. That also adds to the difficulty of studying and knowing about this period because another distinct feature of indigenous American societies is that most of their urban centers were not actually the kind that we see in the Eastern Hemisphere. So they had cities, but they were more like religious ceremonial centers where the, the priests and the kings and the, and the elite families lived and where there were big events and sacrifices and rituals and the ball games that they played. Those kinds of ritualistic ceremonial things were happening in these centers of giant buildings and, and architecture. Uh, they didn't have as much the commerce and the trade and large groups of people living in close proximity to each other that we see in the Eastern Hemisphere. So you'll see that over and over again across Mesoamerica. Um, they build these amazing structures, these amazing temples and palaces, but we don't see the large swaths of, of houses and, and businesses um, nearby to these places because they were ceremonial centers, they weren't city centers. And that's something that's important to note about Mesoamerica is even though they didn't have cities, that still tells us something about what their society was really like, that religion was so crucial to the functioning of society, so much so that it was everything and it was the whole way that their cities were structured was around their religion. There are some exceptions, such as the city of Tenochtitlan, which was the capital of the Aztec Empire, which currently resides where modern day Mexico City is. And that actually did become a large urban center with businesses and merchants and trade and people living there. Um, but that was an anomaly. That wasn't really the case across most of Mesoamerica. 
Reason number four is that Mesoamerican societies had a really bad habit of just disappearing off the face of the planet, sometimes intentionally. They would destroy their own culture and, and their accomplishments for reasons we don't really know. Um, there will have records of a place up until a certain point and then boom, suddenly they're gone. Um, there are lots of theories as to why that is. They think because without a centralized government, there was a, not a lot of strength across a region. And so if one region were to fall to invaders or illness or a drought or some terrible disaster that devastated one part of the region, without the resources and the protection of a centralized government, the whole society would fall apart almost overnight. So the last reason that Mesoamerica is different, and I just think this one is personally really fascinating, there were no domestication of animals in the Americas. With the exception of dogs in North America, they never domesticated animals. And that might not sound like a big deal to you, but it really is. Think about the importance of being able to put wheels behind a horse to drag all your belongings or your lumber or any building materials to build a building, you know, to not have to carry it yourself, um, to be able to use, put wheels behind an animal or ride an animal long distances across country, get on the back of a horse and go somewhere, an ox to plow your fields. You know, Mesoamerican peoples did all of that themselves without the help of animals. There, there aren't really any big pack animals native to the Americas. There's llamas. Llamas can really only hold up to 80 pounds, and even that is a bit much. I actually went to Bogota, Colombia a few years ago, and I purchased a ride on a llama, not knowing that they can only hold 80 pounds. And now I feel really bad that I did that. And also, who is the guy that's selling rides on llamas? That's so much animal cruelty. The fact that they did everything by hand is a huge deal when you think about some of the mo amazing sculptures and architecture that Mesoamerican societies produced. And the first one we're gonna look at, the first society we're gonna look at are the Olmecs. And they are super fascinating because of this whole no animals thing and the things that they were able to accomplish without animals. The Olmec were first discovered in the Leventa region in southern Mexico, uh, and then we've discovered that they've spread all across southern Mexico and much of Central America. The Olmecs are considered by many to be the mother culture of Mesoamerica uh, because they were the first ones who developed things like the Maya's calendar that they used. That was actually something that the Olmecs really started to develop. The Olmecs had a number system that all other societies used after them. They had beliefs about the gods uh, that everyone else believed in, and they had uh, ways of living and constructing their lives and their societies that everyone else used. Now, they're considered the mother culture, but it's also up for debate because we can't really prove that they are the ones who started all these things and that they disseminated these ideas across all of Mesoamerica because we just don't know enough. We don't know how these ideas spread. We just know that the people who did them the oldest group of people who did them were the Olmecs. And you're gonna be learning in your reading how even the term Olmec is a little misleading and doesn't really mean anything. We don't actually know what these people were called. We just know they existed a really long time ago. Now, what the Olmecs are really known for is um, their construction of these colossal human heads. Some of them stand at 10 feet tall and weigh 20 tons, which if you're better at math than I am, I think is 40,000 pounds, so super heavy. So without animals or the wheel to transport these things, you know, they're made of material that comes from super far away from where we have found them. And without animals, they would have had to have human laborers figure out a way to get this material to the ceremonial centers where they've been found. So it just gives you an idea of the the scope and the the magnitude of this civilization that they were able to get in control of a huge population of people and force them to do this kind of labor because the king isn't gonna go around and be pushing a big rock. They gotta get a whole group of people to do it for him. So another thing that we know about the Olmecs that's super fascinating is they're, they have another sculpture, not the colossal heads. They have these crazy looking, historians call them were jaguars, which is like werewolf, but with jaguars. So were jaguars. They call them that because the sculptures are of these kind of half jaguar, half human baby hybrids. And they're 
in a set up in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes there's like a person holding this wear jaguar baby. Sometimes the wear jaguar is just sitting there. Um, and they really, we don't know a ton about them. That's kind of a theme with Mesoamerica. We just don't really know a lot because there's no records and everything was very different. So it's hard to study. Um, but what we do know about the wear jaguars is that they were most likely associated with rain and fertility. Uh, they're often kind of carved into the drainage system of the ceremonial centers across the Olmec heartland. Their connection to the rain was that if these, if they worship these wear jaguars, the rain would come and it would bring crops to the area as well as fertility and lots of babies. So wear jaguars associated with the rain god and fertility and abundance in the land. Now, the last thing that we know about the Olmecs is that we're pretty sure they systematically destroyed their own civilization. There are clear evidences of them having destroyed their cities and ruined their own sculptures and taken everything down and killed their own people. And while it could be true that that could have been done by invaders, most scholars believe it was done by the Olmec people themselves for reasons we still aren't aware of. That's pretty much the gist of what we know about the Olmecs. Sorry to have to change the angle halfway through the video. My iPhone died and my storage is all messed up, so we're using my iPad from now on. Next, we're going to look at the Maya, who their society covered a very similar region as the Olmec, which is why many people consider the Olmec as the mother culture, especially to the Maya, because they were in a similar region. They had a lot of similar practices, so there seems to be a connection there. When you first hear about the Maya, you kind of assume they're like the Persians, where they had an empire, they were a specific group of people, they had a dynasty of rulers, and these are the things that they accomplished. That's not the case with the Maya. The Maya are a lot more like Western civilization. Western civilization encapsulates a lot of different people, a lot of different nations, a lot of different parts of the world, and uh, it has a lot of different, it looks a lot of different ways in all the different places that would be defined as Western. That's the case with the Maya. The Maya is a civilization. So people that had Maya characteristics that we can group all together. Uh, but within the larger category of the Maya, there are a ton of different kingdoms and tribes and rulers and empires and alliances and regional powerhouses and heroes and legends. And each culture had their own traditions and beliefs and practices. Uh, but there are a few things that tie the Maya together as a whole, and that's what we're going to be focusing on rather than the specific details of the people within the Maya society that we know about. Probably the most important thing to know about the Maya that I've already mentioned several times is their calendar. They created this um, incredible mathematical phenomenon of a calendar, and we're going to talk a little bit about how it worked um, try, to try to understand what it meant to the Maya people and how it functioned in their society. So basically the Maya had several different calendars that all kind of worked together to help the Maya priests determine what sort of things would happen on a given day and that would help the kings decide, okay, should we go to war with these people on this day or should we do this ritual on that day or should we sacrifice that person here or there? It was the whole way they thought about every decision that they made was based off of these calendars. It's similar to the Chinese oracle bones that we'll be learning about in a couple weeks. The Chinese people would uh, write inscriptions on bones and then throw them into a fire and however they cracked would tell them things about the future. Uh, and they used this to kind of make decisions in the same way that the Maya did. What's so amazing about the Maya is that it was all based on math, which is just incredible. So. The basic idea of how these calendars worked is that, especially the two main ones, one operated on a 260 day ritual calendar cycle and the other was the 365 day daily cycle. And so, and then there was actually, there was another one that was 52 years long and then there was another one that was a thousand years long. And they would basically imagine all of them in rings and basically they would line them up, figure out mathematically which day they were at for each calendar and they would line it up. So the thousand year calendar is on this day, the 200, the 52 year calendar is on this day, the 260 ritual calendar is here and then the daily calendar is here. And then you would line all of that up and that would tell you what was going to happen that day based on 
you know, kind of the signs and the symbols that are connected with those days. We found these calendars and we found their predictions for these thousand year cycles going back thousands and thousands of years and going up all the way to 2012, um, which is just remarkable. And they were even, they had their calendar down so precise that they didn't have to do a leap year like we have to do. I don't get how that works mathematically, but they were brilliant. I hope that sort of makes sense. You don't need to know the intricacies of how the Maya calendar worked, but that's a basic idea of what it was like. Another defining feature of the Maya society was the importance of the cacao bean. Cacao is what we get chocolate from, and it was such a precious commodity to the Maya that sometimes they used it as currency and they would trade with cacao beans. Now, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, we don't have many documents to work with with the Maya. We actually only have four. And one of them is the Popolva, which is the creation myth of the Maya people. And in the Popolva, it states that the gods created humanity out of maize and water mixed together, and that became flesh and blood. And so for the Maya, we see that their connection to the crops, abundance, fertility, things that we saw, the Olmec revering, are also really important for the Maya. This integration of the world around us, the physical world, and the spiritual world. Now the way that the Maya honored their gods was through human sacrifices, animal sacrifices, and something called ritual bloodletting. It's a very strange idea to wrap your mind around for a modern person, but let's try to set aside our modern mindset and try to think like the Maya people did. So ritual bloodletting was the, the practice of sometimes voluntarily cutting parts of your body and opening them up and keeping them from clotting so that you would freely bleed before the gods. And this was seen as a way to bring rain, to bring the favor of the gods to save the people. Now, this would sometimes be done with captives and prisoners. They would do some ritual bloodletting with them. But we have evidence that there were kings and queens who did this too. And there's a real strong connection across the globe, and sexuality and fertility and abundance and um, the role of the king in garnering favor from the gods. So the Egyptians actually practiced this. The Pharaoh's job was actually to masturbate into the Nile River in order to bring rain. Do what you want with that information. For the, so I only say that to make this feel a little more normal. The Maya would practice, the, the Maya kings would cut their penises and allow the blood to flow from their penises. Um, and then they would, you know, keep it open and let it bleed freely. And Maya queens would cut their tongues and put ropes through their tongues to keep it bleeding. So this idea of the sexuality of the king is intimately tied with the favor of the gods and rain coming to the earth and covering the earth and bringing crops. So these things just reinforce just how much the Maya depended on the favor of the gods for their survival as a society. The last thing to know about Mayan society as a whole is across all of the different societies within the Maya civilization was the practice of a ball game. And this is a really fun part of learning about the Maya is this sport that they invented and played. And it was part of their religion as well. Um, it was used during ritual ceremonies. They would play this game and then the losers would be sacrificed to the gods. It was a huge part of their society. We found like 1800 different ball courts all across Mesoamerica. So it was a big deal to them. And the way this game worked is there was a rubber ball, a very hard eight pound rubber ball that they would, they couldn't touch with their hands or, or their feet. They could only use their hips and their chest to bump it around the arena. And they had to try to get it through these hoops on the sides of buildings. And sometimes there's hoops just up against the, a wall and they have to get it all the way up into the hoop. And sometimes there's a ramp below the hoop where they climb up on the ramp and they get it into the hole that way. The Maya, as we, as we know, are a, a civilization, and within that there's a bunch of different society, societies and cities that had a lot of power. And I just want to talk about two that were really important within the Maya civilization, uh, and that's Tikal and Chichen Itza. Both Tikal and Chichen Itza are modern day archaeological sites that you can still visit today, and they're very popular um, for tourist attractions. Tikal was a 
really popular urban center. Tikal is most famous for its Temple of the Giant Jaguar. It was a stepped pyramid that rose sharply to a height of 154 feet, and it dominated the skyline and represented Tikal's control over the surrounding region, which had a population of about 500,000. There were a lot of bitter conflicts between different small kingdoms within Mayan society, um, but around the 9th century CE, the state of Chichen Itza in the northern Yucatan Peninsula was able to dampen these hostilities and build their own unified state, at least within that region. The rulers of Chichen Itza preferred to absorb captives and integrate them into their society rather than just annihilate them or offer them up as sacrificial victims. Uh, but some captives refused and went to their deaths, while others agreed to recognize the authority of Chichen Itza uh, and participate in the construction of a larger society. You can still visit Chichen Itza today. It's probably the most iconic building of Mesoamerican history. Um, it's now considered one of the new seven wonders of the world. Um, I have visited it myself when I was a kid and it's super tall. I can tell you from personal experience. I don't know the numbers. I don't have the numbers with me right now of how tall it is, but it was incredibly steep and the stairs are a lot bigger than they look in the pictures. So as I was climbing them as a kid and it's super steep, I was so terrified. I was just like, don't look down, just focus on getting to the top. You can do this. You know, I'm hyping myself up. I'm like nine years old. I'm gonna get to the top of this temple. I'm gonna do it. And then my dad, who is like the best guy in the world, but like really loves a picture too much. And so he wanted this perfect shot of all of us climbing this crazy temple. So he's like, everybody turn around, we're gonna take a picture. And you can see from like my sister's face in this picture and um, everyone else, we were all terrified. This was such a terrifying experience. And I just flat out refused. And I was a really obedient kid. Like I did not, I was not a rabble rouser or anything. So for me to not turn around and obey my dad was like a big deal. I was like, no dad, this is not safe. I need to focus. So here you can see me refusing to turn around as I climb the steps of Chichen Itza. The Maya began to decline around 800 CE and pretty much most of the society within a hundred years had disappeared altogether except for in the area around Chichen Itza and that's probably because of civil wars, internal dissension, um, loss of regional control, whatever it might be. But around 900 CE, the Maya had pretty much disappeared from Mesoamerica. Many of the Mayans abandoned their cities and trade ceased in the area. And over time, the jungles came and took over the region and covered all the cities. And now there's another city in Mesoamerica that's important to know about. We just learned about Tikal and Chichen Itza. Um, Teotihuacan was another really important city with around the same time as the other cities in the Maya heartland, but we're not actually sure that it was really a Maya ceremonial center or city um, because it had multi-ethnic influences all across it. So we're really, we don't really know where it came from or who really built it, but Teotihuacan holds some more of the most incredible archaeological findings that we have of Mesoamerica. The reason Teotihuacan is important is because of the large ceremonial structures built within it. You have the Pyramid of the Sun uh, along a long stretch of road across from the Pyramid of the Moon. And they're these colossal structures that are, the Pyramid of the Sun is the same size in circumference or area, I don't know math, of uh, the Pyramid of Khufu in Egypt, although it's not quite as tall. Uh, but it's this immense structure and it's a popular tourist site. It was built near modern day Mexico City, just north of the Lake Texacoco, where Tenochtitlan was the capital of the Aztec Empire. Speaking of the Aztecs, now we're going to talk about the Mexica people, who were different from the Maya, um, shared some of the same cultural traditions, but there's a clear distinction between the people groups, and the Mexica eventually became the Aztec Empire. The first evidence of the Mexica people in southern Mexico is around 1345 when they settled in the region of Lake Texacoco in a very marshy area and decided to build a city on a marsh, which is just insane. But they were incredible engineers and they figured out how to build a city on this marshy land and how to turn this lake into an advantage for their society. There are three big ways Lake Texacoco made for an amazing location for a city like Tenochtitlan. Number one, the lake was filled with fish and waterfowl and other 
sources of food that the people of Tenochtitlan could rely on for food. The Mexico were masters of engineering and so they figured out a way to dredge the soil from the lake's bottom and create this system of agriculture called the Chinampa system and it was the soil was rich from the minerals at the bottom of the lake and they were be able to create abundant crops from this system. Third reason why Lake Texcoco was so advantageous for the people of Tenochtitlan was that it was a natural defense against invasion. They had this body of water around them so unless people figured out a way to bring some boats across land and float across to the city, they couldn't get access to the city. There were three causeways that linked the city to the mainland and they were heavily patrolled by the Mexica warriors. I tried to find pictures of Lake Texcoco. It's actually extinct and it's dried up. And so the city, Mexico City today, there's no evidence of the lake other than archeological, which I think is really sad. Now the Mexica people are the ethnic group from which we get the Aztec Empire. By the early 1400s, the Mexica had become powerful enough to overcome their neighbors and start building an empire. Under the leadership of a man named Motacuzoma, also known as Moctezuma or Montezuma, they were able to take over vast quantities of territory, beginning with the region of Oaxaca and southern Mexico. They eventually joined forces with two neighboring cities, Texacoco and Tlacopan, to form this triple alliance that would be the bedrock of the Aztec Empire. The empire's governance was mostly centralized, not broadly, but pretty well centralized at Tenochtitlan within the Mexica people, and they imposed their room over about 12 million subjects in the area. So we call it the Aztec Empire, but again, it was much more like a territorial state that we saw in early Mesopotamia. They did not have strong centralized government and administration with, you know, bureaucrats going around and making sure everybody's following orders. They really just assessed tribute from the regions around them and created alliances and established their dominance that way. At the high point of the Aztec Empire in the early 1500s, just before the Spanish arrived, they were receiving tribute from 489 other subject cities, towns, and villages. Mexica spirituality was pretty similar to typical spiritual practices and beliefs across Mesoamerica, but there were some unique aspects to it. For starters, they were heavily devoted to one specific god, Huitzilpochtli, who they associated with their military prowess. They believed that because of their devotion to him, he had given them the ability to take over the lands that they were in control of. And one of the things that Huitzilpochtli required of his followers was human sacrifice. So the Mexica, to a larger extent than any other Mesoamerican culture, were super into human sacrifice. It was like their thing, they did it all the time which can give you an idea of why the Catholics and the Spanish, when they came to Mesoamerica, what was so alarming to them is this heavy practice of human sacrifice that was so abhorred in, the, in, in Europe. And to not say that it's okay, the, 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 the genocide that they committed against these people, but to give you a mindset of what was so different for them is that these people are practicing these things that were super contrary to European society. But what's misleading about the Mexica practice of human sacrifice is we associate it with just this bloodthirsty, gory kind of just, ah, oh, we want to kill people kind of religion. Human sacrifice was a ritual essential to the world's survival. It was not entertainment. It was not sport. It was part of their religion. The blood of sacrificial victims would flow across the altar, signifying the continued flow and supply of moisture to the earth for crops and abundance for the people. So that's it for the Mexica. We've covered the Olmec, the Maya, and the Mexica at this point, and we're gonna look at one more people group in the Americas. We're jumping down to South America, to the area of modern day Peru and Argentina and Northern Chile, and we're gonna look at the Inca. The Inca people lived at the same time as the Aztecs. The Olmecs were way back in three, 300 BCE, um, the Maya, began around the 300, 200 BCE and continued on until 900 BC, 900 CE. And then you have the Aztecs and the Inca coming much later in the 12th to the 15th century, excuse me, 12th to the 16th century. Um, and so the Inca come to prominence just about a hundred years before the Spanish conquistadors show up. 
which is really unfortunate because they were an incredibly successful and well advanced society and we just don't know what they could have accomplished if the Spanish hadn't shown up and ruined everything. The key person to know about with the Inca is the ruler named Pachacuti. Pachacuti is, I think, one of the most fascinating people in history. He was this conqueror who took over vast territories for the Inca people, but he was also a deeply spiritual person and an incredibly fierce warrior. He is still revered in Peru today, and there are statues of him all over the country. What he's probably most famous for in the modern world is his construction of the site Machu Picchu, which you've probably seen pictures of at one point in your life. It's this gorgeous ruin on the top of a mountain in the Andes, and it is one another one of the new seven wonders of the world. The 200 buildings of Machu Picchu are made entirely from perfectly cut stones, all fitted together without any mortar. So they basically cut the stones exactly to fit one another and there's nothing holding them together. And the fact that it is still lasted to this day gives you an idea of the level of sophistication of the Inca people. The Inca empire had a population of 11.5 million people at its height and easily ranks as the largest state in the Americas. Now, I know that the Aztecs had a 12 million people within their control, but it wasn't the level of bureaucratic and administrative control that the Inca had been able to gain over their population. The Inca were the exception to the rule of generally no centralized government across Mesoamerica. They did have centralized government and administrators and bureaucrats who traveled the country keeping order and maintaining the empire's control in the area. And one of the ways they did that is through their building of incredibly well-engineered roads all across the empire. They had roads stretching from north to south all across their territory as well as east to west. They were wide enough for eight horses to ride across. This is what the Spanish said about it. They didn't have horses, remember? Um, and they had planted trees all along the roads to provide shade for people traveling along the roads. And there were patrols. They were very safe places to travel. It was an incredible achievement for the Inca people. There was even, it's, it's even been said that the rulers of the capital city of the Inca Empire, Cusco, could request for fresh fish from the coast and within two days they could have their food delivered to them because the roads were that um, easy to travel across. One last thing on the Inca, they did not have a writing system. The Maya and the Olmec both had writing systems and mathematics. The Inca never developed a writing system and it's tempting to see that as making their society less advanced than other parts of the world, but as we've already seen, they had incredible advancements and just because they didn't have a writing system does not mean they didn't know what was up with mathematics. And we know that because of this incredible device that they created called the kipu. And this was a string of a bunch of other strings with knots tied in it to keep track of numbers and statistics and information about the empire. So I've linked a video below that explains how the kipu worked and how it was such an incredible mathematical achievement. Um, I don't have time to explain it here, but I encourage you to check that out. I thought it was a super fascinating video. The Inca religion was very different from the rest of Mesoamerica. Um, there were a lot of similar beliefs in gods and sacrifices and this sort of thing, but a key feature of the Inca was their belief in a moral dimension to their religion, which was different from the other societies. They believed that human misbehavior was sinful and that each person needed to live a moral and ethical life in order to guarantee a good afterlife. They believed strongly in an afterlife, more so than other societies in Mesoamerica. And they even believed in rituals of confession and penance in which their priests would absolve them of their sins and bring them back into the good graces of the gods. So that's everything on the Incas. Today we talked about the Olmecs, the Maya, the Mexica, who became the Aztec Empire. Uh, we looked at the city of Tenochtitlan, Tikal, Chichen Itza, Teotihuacan, and then we looked at the Inca people and Pachacuti and the Kipu and uh, their road system. Um, I hope you learned a lot today. I hope this stuff is interesting to you. I find it really interesting myself. Um, you have a lecture quiz due on Tuesday and a reading comprehension question due as well. And then you have your first part 
your first milestone of the final project due on Thursday. You'll be picking your topic for your research paper. So be sure to look over those instructions. If you have any questions on how to pick a topic and how to complete the assignment, please email me. But all the information is on Canvas. So thank you for watching. Have a fabulous week. Thank you.